Um, okay, so I always start with motivation. Um, we were fortunate to have had uh, not one, but four amazing tutorials so far in, in, in this um, school. Um, and I'm going to shift a bit away from um, talking about the basic algorithms, um, A3C, DQN, um, TD learning, and so on. And I'm going to rather now assume that if we had those algorithms, what kind of problems could we solve? And what are the kind of problems that we want to solve that we still cannot do? Um, so what I'm hoping is that I'll provide you with some sort of source of um, inspiration for problems that you might want to attack to, to make progress um, in AI. And not just AI in general, but in, in also applications that could be useful um, in engineering and healthcare and so on. Okay, so motivation one, physics and bodies. Um, this is kind of philosophical, but it, it's, it's certainly how I feel about the problems. Um, I think there's two ways to uh, work in AI. One is you, you work on narrow AI and you build something that works really well for solving a problem. And that is extremely useful and that's what's paying off out there and is enabling us to build all sorts of cool things including um, um, you know, image recognition systems, um, with RL systems, we're starting to go a little bit more into medical applications, into self-driving cars and so on. Um, so that's, that's a great thing to do. Um, but some of us also want to understand how brains work, how minds work. Um, and to that extent, we need to actually understand um, natural intelligence. And it is impossible to understand natural intelligence without considering the environments in which we are uh, placed and without thinking about the fact that you have bodies and much of your brain um, exists because it has to serve your senses and your actuators and it has to deal with predators and it has to deal with friends and so on. Um, now I also like to then focus on environments that have where the laws of physics apply. Um, there's gravity, there's a ground that you can't go through. Um, there's very interesting sort of interactions. If I touch this thing, the projector will go off and so on. Um, and that causes all sorts of problems. Um, contact forces are extremely complex. It's very hard to simulate them and that's also because it's very hard uh, to deal with objects. Uh, walking is hard because there's all these contacts between us and the ground. Manipulating, it's even harder because then there's all these complex um, interactions between our fingers and objects. Um, so why would I want to bring in physics into environments as opposed to just try to do, just stick with Atari and so on? Um, that's because I think physics will actually simplify the problem. Um, if you're always in the same environment, and the same laws apply, and you encounter similar objects, and you have the same body, um, you will able to do much better than if you have very sudden changes of bodies and environments and so on. Um, if you were born in space and grew up in space and you were to be brought to Earth, you would not be able to walk um, because you wouldn't transfer. However, because we're always in the sort of similar environments, if we fly to Japan, uh, we have no trouble grabbing a cup of green tea. You know, we, it's a common object for us, and it's also the same hand, it's the same muscle. Uh, what the cup of tea does to your arms is the same as what it does here in Canada. And so physics provides us with a lot of consistency, and I think this consistency is what allows us to do transfer learning very easily, to sort of to transfer our knowledge from one place to the other, from one task to another task, and also it enables us to keep doing continual learning. Um, there's more to the story. The body also changes. Uh, we learn to walk when we're babies. If you try to learn to walk now, you will probably kill yourself because babies are close to the ground. Gravity doesn't kill them. But an adult falling actually can have um, 
tragic consequences. Um, and of course, if we focus on uh, physics simulation, um, and if we make physics more realistic, and with the moment we have bodies, um, then we start um, creating environments that will be mirror more closely the, the, the real world. So if you were interested ultimately in building those robot hands that will come and pick up your dishes and wash your dishes and so on and iron and all of those um, dreamy science fiction apps, then we do need to be able to sort of mirror, um, go from simulation to the real world. Uh, robots are very tricky to play with. Um, um, in terms of safety, you know, it's very easy, you know, these are sort of heavy machines and so on, so they can very easily break things. They can break themselves, and because of that, it actually, the, the iteration for experiments is very slow. So if we try, if we can do things in simulation and then try to transfer that knowledge to the real world, um, that can actually be useful. Also, in simulation, we can actually test um, how agents learn uh, how agents interact and so on. We can learn a lot about agents and so we can then transfer that knowledge to the real world. Hopefully we learn a new insights that will help us um, do all sorts of planning in the real world, whether, even if it's like policy and so on. Um, the other motivation, um, and this one is for Peter and Satinda, are they here? Where are they? Oh, there. So he, he asked me for this video. Um, reward. Um, this task, actually Peter yet last night was telling me no robot on earth is capable of doing this task, pulling two Lego pieces apart. So there's a good challenging problem. Um, it also showed how she had this reward, right? So it's like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you see like my happy dog there on the right, yeah, like turning around. Uh, my other daughter happily playing in the same park uh, with the dog. Um, actually, this is near DeepMind in London. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, where do all these rewards come from? They're very different than the rewards that we typically put in our reinforcement learning machines, uh, which we often engineer and so on. Um, there's a lot of work on end-to-end -end machine learning, um, but this, this question of how do you bring in rewards and so on, um, I think it's, a, it's one that still needs to be understood. We don't know the intrinsic motivators that make you know, that dog search for happiness. Um, of course, the emotional systems come into play, they're like the oldest systems, all animals have them. Um, and also, there is this desire to explore, to seek for knowledge, um, survival, and so on. And none of these is enough to answer the question. You can actually find flaws with most of these arguments. For example, survival would mean that if, if intelligence is about survival, that would mean that cockroaches are way more intelligent than humans, because they most likely will survive uh, Holocaust and so on. Um, and they certainly are here with us through the evolutionary process. Um, so this remains a big question. Um, and how to get rewards in general is like I think one of the biggest questions um, in uh, reinforcement learning. Today I'm going to tell you about two simple ones or two at least well-defined ways to think about it. One is through language. Um, for the machine a reward should be to follow instructions. If you, uh, so we saw Phil Blanson giving a talk last week on this, and I'm gonna sort of touch more on this. You can tell the machine, do that or do this, and that's, that should be the reward. The machine gets reward for doing what you're asking the machine to do. Um, and of course, uh, imitation. Um, Joelle, uh, when she started her introduction, she mentioned how, explore, uh, how to deal with complex exploration and so on, um, you can imitate. Uh, when, I, when I presented uh, the, the video of the crow last week, I mentioned that these crows actually will learn to create tools um, that vary according to the region, to, like, to the com crow communities. 
Um, that's because they're learning to do so by imitation. They learn to do it after a year. And pretty much all animals will sort of, if, if, if they don't have like, like cub bears here in Canada, for example, <laughs> they don't have their mothers when they're little, they will not learn to hunt or search for berries and um, whatever else they eat. So start with language. And so I'm going to start, let me bring my, uh, with some motivation from children. And I always think of children playing in a playground with lots of blocks and stuff as a robot in an assembly line um, that has to do lots of flexible things. They're not that different. You kind of, it's the same sort of thing. You, want, you would love to have this robot learning to do many things. Um, so robots are actually very good for specific things. If what you have to do is construct a specific brand of a shoe or dismantle an iPhone, uh, we have really good machines for doing that. Um, in fact, uh, um, uh, I mean, we've seen, we built cars like that. In fact, Apple does dismantle uh, phones using uh, robots and so on. Um, but if you have to do a very diverse set of things when you, you don't know ahead of time exactly what it is that you have to do, um, then you need to have um, the kind of dexterity that we're trying to build in robots that is still miss. The kind of dexterity that these children have, the kind of dexterity that my daughter show, was showing at one year of age of being able to pull two blocks of Lego apart. Um, and at the same time being able to do other things. So I think of children as immersed in a stream of rewards. Um, most rewards are not being given to us explicitly, um, but I'm getting reward right now just by watching you, because w whenever you smile there, I get reward. So that means I'm, like, I'm saying the right thing. When I see someone there frowning, someone that's looking at the laptop, not paying attention, I'm like, hmm, I'm not making this exciting enough. <laughs> um, Right? It, it's an endless process, and it's, help, it's happening self-consciously. I'm trying to think about what I'm going to say, but at the same time, implicit out there, I'm getting all these reward signals. So when I think of a baby reaching for a block, um, that baby is probably trying to avoid the other baby that is trying to hit it with uh, some stick, and is trying to get around obstacles, and is planning how to extend its arm. It's really doing lots of things. And it's getting all, this, all these signals, and it should be learning from all these signals. So that's the basis of, um, so this is an observation that actually was made uh, by uh, Rich Sutton a while ago, and he created this architecture called the Horde, uh, which aimed to do this kind of thing, to try to build our algorithms that are capable of doing uh, many things. And we saw um, last week when um, Phil Branson presented his work in language that he was talking about his architectures and Unreal um, being a more modern version of doing um, similar things. Um, so I'm going to mention another one here. Um, it's a very simple idea. So you take um, one of the algorithms that was presented yesterday by Peter, the DDPG, uh, Deep uh, Deterministic Policy Gradients, where you typically have an actor network that looks at observations. And in this case, instead of having one policy that produces actions, let's assume that we have, say, M policies. Um, and each of these actors feeds the action into another network, which we will call a critic. A critic might share some features um, from the sensory stream. Um, and then each critic will sort of, um, sort of each actor will have a critic that is sort of evaluating how well it's doing the job. So the objective function now you can think of as maximizing, uh, making sure that you come up with a policy that satisfies all these critics. So you, you might, for example, take the sum of um, over all the Q functions. This is often done in game theory when you have multiple agents. Um, so the, the rest is detail. The rest is just about computing the gradients of these things. And um, the tools that we have now, most of them do that for us. 
Now, that's not enough. So having an architecture, so this is all good because now we have an architecture where we have one policy, not many policies. So you can learn many things and you could have these many critics sort of evaluating many things. And that's basically what the Horde was doing with linear models. What I'm doing here is doing this with nonlinear models. Um, but you also need to be able to come up with lots of tasks for this agent to do. And if, you, if you're going to do that, then there's this problem of constructing environments where many tasks can arise. And so one thing one can do is to build, say, a physical environment where there's objects and where there is an actuator. So the, the actuator sort of imagine it, it's, it's a hand that sort of knocks the blocks. And what you control is the actuator. So you apply forces to that or control the speed of the act actuator and then it, it will interact with the objects. Of course, this is sort of makes it harder because you can, when you push it, it's not like you have access to the center of mass, but you touch the object like, say, in this corner, it might rotate. If you touch it too hard, it can fly off, and so on. Um, this, by the way, I, I think it hasn't been mentioned, but this environment that I'm using here, it's called Mujoko. Um, there is a family of um, physics. So physics simulation is big and it's extremely important. Um, so some environments are very good for um, being able to do sort of robotics or where you need to, to have very, very detailed physical simulation while still being able to do it in real time. So there's Mujoko and uh, another one, it's Bullet. And um, and if you use like the Open Gym of OpenAI, they will support um, both of these uh, tools. I think they're shifting to Bullet. Um, if Peter was here, he could uh, advertise it more, but uh, he's missing. And of course, then there's all, phys uh, there's all these game uh, engines that have sort of physics engines, but those are a bit, uh, bit coarser and so on. Um, but this is very important. Because to push RL in simulation, we kind of need to push our simulator. So doing sort of rich simulation in graphics um, is also a, I, I, I think it's one of the important problems to design AI, not to be ignored. Um, in addition to having a physical environment uh, where there's gravity and friction and so on, we need to be able to tell the machine how to do many things. And to this end, language is very useful, because language is combinatorial. Um, it's, it's a way of taking just a few, um, in fact, Humboldt used to call it the, 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 the infinite from the finite. You take a few resources and you can start combining them in all sorts of ways and say many things. It's one of the really powerful things about having uh, language. And I think it's the key thing that uh, we often, in fact, think of it's what, um, when people think of humans as being intelligent and I'm as, as not being intelligent. I think the degree to which we manipulate symbols is indeed what makes us um, different. So one way to specify rewards then is just by having relations between, um, say, these objects. So for example, it's very easy to say that um, gather to, say, one particular region like this part here means that you have to satisfy a relation that says that the red block has to be near the pad for some particular state of the environment. And so now you need to sort of ground symbols. So we might say that near might be this distance away from the pad. So you can specify in an environment uh, what you mean by near, what you mean by far, what you mean by east of, what, what do you mean by against. And of course, this is easier to say than to do because sometimes near is, uh, it's, uh, there's a question of scale here, like Portugal is near Spain, but they're ma or Portugal is near um, France, um, but there's this massive distance in between um, Portugal and France, whereas I can say this laptop is near my phone, and so if you look at, at the picture, it's kind of like the map, but this distance is tiny. Um, but nonetheless, this is a way to do it. Is you specify language and you create some grounding. Um, and now once you have language, if you have relations like this, you can generate lots of tasks uh, very easily. 
And so here you can see uh, the agent following the task. So it moves, it sort of st stops pushing the blue, um, and then eventually goes and gets all the other blocks. And this is just showing how it achieves the task. So this idea of specifying rewards with uh, formal language or first order logic is not, uh, um, is, uh, not new. So Michael Littman actually gave a talk on Ichikai on this a couple of years ago. And there's a very nice uh, paper and archive. They use temporal logic because they're interested in things that have to do with time. Do this, then do that, or keep doing this until some other event happens. Um, here, so a nice thing about having an agent doing one task, and in particular following a policy, um, is that with this architecture that I showed you, even though if you might be doing one thing, like bringing these two blocks together, in the process, you're actually also learning to solve all the other tasks. So you're not just learning to do one thing, but the agent that learned to do this, while it was learning to bring two blocks together, um, it was able to learn to push two blocks apart. It was able to learn to put one block to the left of the other block. And here, by the way, green means success, red means that it's currently not satisfying the reward. Um, it learns to move blocks in one particular direction, or it might learn even to apply strong forces um, uh, to the blocks. So all these tasks are learned actually in one run. So the idea is you learn many things as opposed to just learning one thing at a time. So you mean here that you were giving all those other rewards as well, or that while the, we're just focusing on one task, you have transferred to the other task? Correct. So, Which one so you you're given, you generate all the rewards. OK, so you have multiple. You have language. Through language, you can generate as many rewards as sort of your environment and your language constructs uh, enable you. So now you have all these policies and now you learned all of them. And then the question becomes of which, how do you choose which policy to act accordingly? And um, that is a big open question. So one depends on the agent that you use. If it has a replay buffer and so on, um, you probably might want to do something that sort of encourages exploration. And so it becomes then a question of curriculum. You might want to do random policies and so on. So Completely open. Were there here a uh, combination of words which were never seen as a reward? I will come to that soon. <laughs> Good question. Bear with me for a few slides, Simon. Go ahead. So um, can we also describe what, what you're doing as like having uh, parameterized policies, but in the sense of a kind of diaries, where it's a policy now in the state, sort of an abstract description of what it's trying to do? I'm not familiar with the paper that you're citing, so maybe I can talk to you after, mm -hmm. and we can check whether it's similar or not. OK, so very quickly. Um, this is actually a very simple thing. I'm not going to, I have cooler stuff to show you today. Um, but I just want to hammer this point. Um, when you show the, when you look at the learning curves for this agent, um, when it has one policy, six policies, or 18 policies, learning to push two blocks apart, the more things it's doing, the faster it learns. Okay? So, and recall that when I say when the baby is reaching for that object, it's actually, it's learning to reach, it's learning to extend its arm, it's, it's doing many things. Babies, in fact, they, they have all these uh, over like 50 different types of flails and movements and so on. Um, babies twitch at night a lot because they're learning. Uh, um, if you take rats and you stop rats from being able to twitch at night, they don't develop motor development. Um, during the day. So there is a lot of incidental behavior that is very important to you being able to learn to solve some tasks consciously. There's a lot that you are doing consciously, like standing and so on, that is providing reward and that can help you learn other things faster. Lots of questions. I'm going to start over there, then you.
Um, there is a lot of work in psychology indeed. So, in fact, a lot of the, what I draw inspiration from is psychology, in particular uh, motor development. So there's many psychologists doing. Um, there is one, I forget her name, she's in uh, NYU. So if you actually Google motor development space NYU, the first hit is a really good paper um, on this. It's a fascinating read, so I strongly recommend it. Uh, Chaba? Do you want to go back a couple of slides when you showed the architecture and wondering what was being shared between these tasks? Very little is being shared, just the visual features. I will show soon an architecture where more is being shared. So what's shared? Um, this is shared. So when, when you don't see multiple things in three years sort of going into the page. And this is not shared. Otherwise, they're all independent. So, so the left-hand side shows a policy network? Correct. So that's, that's the policy. And that's the Q function. Shared. Because for each reward, you are going to have a different policy network, so, right? Like, or some part of Oh, no, no. So, so this policy, shared. sorry, what this picture is showing is you have one latent layer, another latent layer, and then you have many sort of soft maxes to choose your action, or many Gaussian policies. The, yeah, each of these, so each of, there's four, okay, so like, actually end up right, being Gaussian because for, for we're continuous. But, okay. But there are four policies here, right. and then four critics. Right. I wouldn't make too much of this architecture. There's many ways of implementing this architecture. This is really a simple way of doing it. Um, I think what's more important is the message that you, when we build RL, we should stop thinking of, let's do one thing. Because doing more sometimes is indeed doing more even doing better at that one thing. Um, so not only do you do better, and you in fact learn all the other policies at, at the same time, but in some cases doing more is essential. Um, so this task is deceivingly simple, but it turns out to be very hard. Um, uh, for a robot arm to reach to locations is easy. Pulling the leg apart is very hard. Interaction with objects is very hard. So in fact, when I try to do something like bringing three blocks to the corner, um, that re that's a very long exploration problem. I have to go around, ta -ta -ta -ta, find a block and bring it here. And then I have to go many more steps, I grab another block and bring it back there. And then I have to, you know, and I sort of have to remember that I'm doing all the stuff. Um, so when we try a single policy, uh, when there's just one task, which is bring all the uh, blocks together, it actually fails. So this DDPG, which is one of the best agents that, was, um, the, uh, uh, that is out there, completely fails. Whereas if you have agents that actually are doing more things that are, although incidental, help. So in order to bring three blocks together, it helps to know how to go two blocks, or it helps to know how to bring two blocks together, and, and so on. If, if you actually have learned, um, or, and, and this is the same th as what I was referring to as to why we twitch at night. Yeah, at, if at night you're learning to twitch because you can sort of activate a particular muscle. Um, and so you learn controllability of a particular actuator. And once you know how to control parts of your body, um, you can start doing more complex movement. Do you have a curve where you would draw the same seven tasks only? For the 43, because like, how do you know it's not if you had some of the tasks which were easier than other in the 43, and that's why the average reward is higher? Um, yeah, we need to calibrate for that. So this curve doesn't calibrate for that. I but I do check that all the tasks are indeed achieved. So we plot those videos showing that uh, we can check uh, the number of times each of these are achieved. Now. That's not the only way in which you can use language. So Phil Blansom last week presented this, where he was showing these agents in a different type of environment, going around, following language instructions to find uh, particular objects in this environment. Um, now, the models that Phil uses uh, are slightly different. Um, they're based on um, the A3C agents. 
And there, there's two modalities. And so the way the language comes in here is as an, Im uh, as an input that gets processed by an LSTM. Um, the image gets processed by a ConvNet. The two are uh, combined. Um, you have LSTMs here because you have to deal with the fact that you have um, partial observability and you want to remember where an object might have been in case you have to uh, go back. And, and I should say, by the way, that the models that we're uh, using these days, then they're not just a single ConvNet. Um, I'd already showed you some exotic architectures this morning, and we've seen that over the last two years that these, the neural networks for control have become um, quite modular, and they actually, they're not just a ConvNet or an LSTM, but quite often you will have elements different types of neural network modules being combined to produce um, networks that can actually solve the problems. Um, so it's not a question of just replacing a linear model by a neural network or an RBF by a neural network. Now a lot of thought actually goes into how to um, engineer the neural networks to be able to deal with uh, memory tasks, to be able to deal with uh, partial observability and so on and different modalities. Um, Phil also mentioned that we also, in that context, try to predict rewards. We might use TD to control, um, say, the pixels of the image, to sort of to seek novel regions of space. We might try to make sure that we provide partial supervision in an unsupervised way by using an autoencoder that reconstructs the input. Uh, and so on. So a very good paper detailing a lot of these innovations is this paper by Max Yadderberg um, called um, Unreal um, that was presented at iClear. And so the ideas are very similar to what I've discussed thus far, but in the A3C setup. I'm going to skip this. Um, an important thing of having language um, is that when you specify the goals with language, you can now also have the, have the network sort of predicting, especially if you have these auxiliary tasks that try to predict language, then by having the network going around and making predictions, you can sort of peek into the mind of the agent. And in an age where interpretability is becoming an important question, I think it's um, language, having language in your models um, could be very useful. Now, another way of um, thinking about language is to connect with programs. So, um, and when I say language here, all along I'm talking about formal language. Um, and if you're talking about formal language, you're talking about first order logic and you're talking about programs as well. And so how do we program a neural network? We want to be able to have a way of telling the neural network what to do. We want to tell the RL agent what to do. Could we sort of write a program with for loops and so on and recurrence, et cetera, that will make a neural network go and execute some behaviors out there in the world? Um, so Misha Daniel has been um, giving a lot of thought to this, and I'm just going to show you some of his work. Um, before, like the idea of using programs for RL, um, uh, um, it's not a new one. It's very much tied with work that's done in reinforcement learning, especially options, hierarchical RL, and the, the literature on this topic is quite vast. Um, one recent work that I quite liked is this one by Jacob Andreas um, and colleagues, where he specifies, and this is going to be relevant to the kind of work that uh, we do, um, he specifies um, tasks by breaking um, a task like make planks into sub-linguistic tasks like get wood and use workbench. Okay, so the plan is, so you have, you break into these two components and then make sticks also breaks into components, get wood and use tool shed. But in this case, both of these tasks, task one and task two, they share sub-components. They share this get wood sub-component. And so what they essentially are going to do is they're going to learn a hash if you will, that will choose a network depending on what it is that you have to do. So provided that you have this hierarchical structure, 
So they're not learning this, but provided you have this hierarchical structure, you can sort of sketch to a particular neural network and you can learn that neural network. So every time the task is, involves get wood, the same get wood behavior gets called. Um, and there's been a lot of very successful work that does this. So if you know the, the architecture of a network, learning the modules is easy and we can do really well. If you know, um, if you know the modules, the modules are fixed and what you do is you learn the architecture, we can also do that and we can do that well. And that's called probabilistic programming and there's a lot of uh, good papers by Josh Tedenbaum and colleagues on this. Um, we don't know how to do both at the same time yet. That's also an open problem. Hierarchical RL is still uh, challenging. Now, one of the things that also is worth uh, thinking about is how we're telling agents what to do. In this case, uh, what Jacob was doing was telling it uh, what to do by specifying how to do it. In order to make sticks, you have to get wood and then you have to go to the to uh, use the tool shed and so on. Um, this is the how to do it. And, and, then there, and then there is the more command based way of telling someone what to do, which is um, put the two blocks together. It's an instruction, an imperative. Um, this is not new in AI. Uh, there was Lisp uh, and there was Prolog. Uh, um, there was imperative and declarative programming styles in AI. And this is basically what's actually shaped a lot of our programming languages. Um, I think for many tasks, it will be useful to just have the, the declarative way. And for others, it will be uh, useful to specify the procedure by means of which something gets achieved. Now, why would we want agents to execute programs? For many reasons. So as I said, so that they can follow instructions, you actually do what you want them to do. And I don't anticipate this to be useful in a factory because you don't, I don't see myself going to the factory and say, um, robot, build me a new Nissan, sent, or Nissan whatever, uh, car. Um, but you could think of this as in household robotics and so on could be useful. Like, you know, robot, make sure that the kids aren't, uh, aren't breaking anything upstairs um, and so on which would be a very useful robot to have at home, actually. <laughs> um, the other thing is, um, by having s symbolic representations, programs, I think this will give us a way of, um, uh, this could give us a way of getting dis a disentangled understanding of objects. One of the problems with deep nets and so on is they don't understand that this is an object. They don't understand that it doesn't come apart if you were to pull it. It doesn't understand that if there is a, um, a cockroach in my hand, I can do this and kill it. So I can make all sorts of predictions about this because I understand it as an object. I can reason about it, um, unlike a convnet. Um, and so another thing about objects is if, um, if you have a language about objects and relations, you have, uh, you have a combinatorial code. So you can talk about the red cat or the blue cat or the green cat. So you can sort of start mixing properties and creating all sorts of things. You can talk about the, the, the red cat on top of the, 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 the green unicorn flying over Montreal. And you all know what I mean by that and can imagine it. Uh, so it's, very, it's a very rich a way of sort of composing. And if you can compose, you can do zero shot tasks like we just did. The thing that I described to you is new. You've never seen it before and yet you knew what it was. Um, and another thing that arises as a problem with neural networks is this catastrophic forgetting. So what is that? That's if you train a network on a data set and you finish training and then you start training it on a new data set, it will forget everything about the first data set. So you need to have a representation that as you give it new data, it doesn't forget what it learned before. So it, it should be able to continue learning forever. Um, it should be robust to distractions. If you learn how to move two blocks together when there is something else in the background that is irrelevant to the task, if you change that something else in the background that's irrelevant to the task by something else, you should not change your answer. 
a lot of our agents at present break down because of that. Um, of course, you want it to be trained end to end. So Rich was absolutely right yesterday. Um, it has to be end to end and it has to scale with computation. I should add that to the slide. Um, and it would also be nice that it learns interpretable representations. And I think language here will be useful. Because for a lot of applications, whether they say in, in medicine or in law, where compliance is an important thing, um, it's important that you understand what the networks are doing. This is not, I guess, the reasoning only for why you would want agents to execute programs, but I hope this also tells you about what is, how far we are from um, getting deep learning and reinforcement learning to really work in practice. There's still a lot of uh, huge outstanding problems. Do we need the ambiguity of human language? So Phil made a good, um, ha had a few good points about this. Um, at this point, what I'm interested in is actually being very precise. I want the robots to understand precisely what, um, what I want to communicate with them. Um, and I'm doing this, one, because of that conviction, and because I think that's a good thing, um, but also because we have yet very poor ways of bringing in natural language um, into simulation. And also, yeah, we, uh, let's take this one offline. Th this becomes a big debate. It's complicated. For now, I'm going to go with uh, formal language. Um, so here is one task where we can use a, a robotic arm. And this robotic arm will have to reach to different objects on the table. So for example, re reach the blue sphere, or reach the red, um, to the red block. But in all these tasks that I'm showing you here, um, the robot when it was being trained hadn't seen them. So that's the answer for Simon who just left. Um, someone else will have to convey to him. <laughs> So these are what we call zero-shot tasks. The robot wasn't trained to, to deal with these combinations or with these different numbers of objects, but it's able to do that. Um, um, and in particular, it, at training time, you might ask it to learn to reach to the blue, the blue sort of sphere or the red cube. But at test time, I might ask it to reach for the red block. It was never trained with just red. It always had the conjunction, red block or, sorry, red cube or green sphere or blue cylinder, but it didn't know block. It didn't know just red, what just red is. So it, it has learned that generalization, that this property is independent of shape, and I can reach for that, pro the thing that has that property. Or, it can, or you can vary the number of objects, or you might even to introduce a new object that it has never seen before, and you can ask it to reach for the new um, red block, and through a formal language it can reason that these two things it has seen before, which are the red things, so therefore what I must reach for is this other thing. Uh, sure. So for example, when you say you here, the, the agent is aware of It, it is through the program. I'll make that a bit more precise. Okay. Thank you. So, sorry, just a bit on that last point. So, so reach for a new red block. It, it reasons that it doesn't know what a block is, and it doesn't know what this object is, and so it makes that connection. Is that what you said? Correct. But we specify the reward in logic. So we don't actually uh, start introducing new natural language, but we actually specify, um, we have a logic, we, we actually specify a program that is equivalent of reach for the new red block. So this is all formal language. I've sort of parsed it here into nice English so that you can understand. Um, now, the, to give you a sense of how hard these tasks are, um, we're going to consider two design spaces. So what are design spaces? Basically, this two by two design means that there's 
um, two properties like um, say uh, two colors and two shapes and the agent in this case gets trained on all four and gets tested on all four. In this other domain uh, that Misha calls 2L, the agent gets trained in these three combinations and then it will get tested in this other combination that it has never seen before. If you train a DDPG agent, um, then on, on this thing here, 2C in yellow, for both training and test, it does beautifully, so it learns. Um, if you go to this case where it only gets to see blue, when it sees blue it does very well, but at zero shot it completely fails. Zero shot is hard. So unless we do something special, your normal neural network is not going to do it for you. It will fail. So the architecture that we came up with is the following. And I'm going to go over it uh, quickly. But if you go to and search for programmable agents on archive, you'll find a detailed explanation. And I'd be happy to chat with you about it over the next uh, couple of days. But basically, assume that you have, and for now let's assume that we have observations that consist of a list of objects. And then for each of these objects, you have a long list of features. Um, so this could be pixels, or if you don't want to learn from vision all the time, this could be the actual positions of the objects. It could be you know, their orientation, etc. It could be the relation of those objects to your actuator. Because actually, at the end of the day, what matters is how the world relates to my body. And what we're going to learn is a mapping that generates a matrix of objects by properties. We want to learn automatically the properties of the objects. What will make it possible is that we will inject a program that will hash, just like we were, um, just like Jacob Andreas was hashing, giving a, giving a program you deterministically, if, if the program is, I don't know, red, it will always automatically uh, hash to this uh, uh, row of the matrix. This is very much like word embeddings. In word embeddings, you have a one hot encoding for the word, and then you have a lookup table, and then you get the embedding. Um, but in addition to just doing that, what we do with word embeddings, we're going to apply soft logic. So there's going to be this sort of operators and x times y, for example, would be the end of x and y, and soft or. And that will give us a vector that will indicate which objects are relevant uh, to what's being uh, to the program. Um, we then will use in the architecture something called uh, interaction networks. Um, and this is an architecture that was proposed um, uh, at DeepMind. There's a few um, other variants um, out there. Um, and actually there's a very nice paper by Oriol Vinyals and some colleagues on uh, message passing on graphs um, that um, reviews a lot of these architectures neural architectures that are about objects and how they interact with each other, even though you never actually specify what the objects are. So if you haven't seen interaction networks, relational networks, I strongly recommend you look at those architectures because I think it's some of the most exciting architectures um, um, in deep learning right now. Um, so we do some message passing. Um, I won't go into details. Um, but this allows us to compute a policy and also get a, a key function. Um, the only point here is that, again, I emphasize that the neural is not just about anymore a linear model versus a neural network. A lot of thought goes into how you design these neural ma uh, networks. And their design is very modular. It's not just about putting a bunch of covnets together. Um, if we zoom in, a bit more into the program. So we start with our observations and what we're learning is how to map those observations to this matrix of properties by objects and then how to apply relations to it um, and then generating a sort of a program vector embedding that then gets executed by the neural network. All of this is end-to-end -end differentiable. That we need to sort of satisfy that. So. Pardon? Is every black arrow yes. 
So everything, every sort of line that you see in this thing will be like a multi-layer perceptron or so. It's a, tra it's a non-linear transformation or a linear transformation, but importantly, it's all differentiable. So obviously I don't have time. I could spend just a whole hour and a half going into that architecture. Um, but let me just rather show you quickly some of the things that it's possible to achieve if you spend the time designing such an architecture. And if you in particular pay attention to language to specify to a machine what to do. Um, so first of all, the programmable ones are able to do on these tasks. Uh, so the uh, test time, they're able to actually learn. Um, of course, there's still some that are unstable. Um, and here I'm showing you many curves for different trials. So you'll get a good sense of also variance. Um, and then this is a task where there's more properties um, here the DPG completely fails as well um, and the programmable agent still is able to do the job. Um, okay, so here's a, the more fun part of it where you get to see it um, doing different tasks. Um, and this, these are all things that I hadn't encountered before. So, we've, uh, so Misha here, uh, Misha and Sergio were varying the number of objects. Um, they introduced new objects, so it, it had never seen um, magenta stuff. And so they introduce um, these sort of magenta capsules and it's still, it's still able to reason about that. So let's quantify this a little bit more. Um, let's consider all these different tasks. So first, most of the tasks are of, uh, in this case are rich tasks. And as I said before, rich tasks are easier than other tasks. So that's, where this is easy is that th these are rich tasks. Go to, is a, uh, does, uh, they involve less contact. Um, now, what's interesting about here is that all that's being done here is zero shot. It's doing things that it never encountered in, it's using combinations of color and shape uh, for example, that it had never seen before. And this is actually how I specify the programs. This basically says near, the hand must be near um, something that has this color and this shape. Um, the random agent fails at all these tasks. Uh, it's always important to plot the random agent, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes a random agent will su be surprisingly good. Um, and the DPG is just as good as the random agent here. Um, on the training data, um, this works well. When we move on to evaluation on uh, unseen combinations, it does the job. Um, if we ask for it to reach to just the red thing or just the blue thing without saying what the thing is, it's still able to do the job. So here we've changed the program. Note that we dropped um, so it's a new program, it's able to execute it. Um, shape it executes, um, it's able, to, you can now introduce the not, even though at training time you never explain to it what not is. So this is a novel program that it has, it's a novel construct that it didn't have before, but it's able to do it. Um, this one here, and it's because it reasons with ors and ands, as you know, uh, to get that. Um, it's able to, you can change the number of blocks. So for testing, uh, because you are changing the program, so you are, what you are doing is you are modifying the program part of the, of, of the, of the network, and then you are using that for action. So as you, when you change the program, because if this has learned to disentangle, and it has learned to separate red from green and shapes, so that means that it's actually changing the network. It's changing this vector. Of, um, that you get from understanding properties. That vector basically decides which objects are present that changes this graph neural network. It will change the neural network. And so some parts of the network will never be active and some parts of the network will be active. And that's also what allows us to do continual learning and to avoid to get disentangling and to avoid interference of tasks. Because I didn't saw that in the, in, the, in the architecture, unless they're working on and, and, or and, and you have them. So I didn't saw that, that piece, so it can be as an input. So that's a reason. Yeah, so, so, so the fact that I'm going, um, so the key, okay, so I'll go quickly into that. 
The, the reason for why I'm trying to go to this sort of more discrete combinatorial thing is so that in particular by, reason, by having different commands being given um, specified as these programs here um, which hash to different rows of this uh, if I am able to learn from something that to go from something dense to something that's sparse categorical then I can sort of modify these I will get different vectors here and these vectors will determine which objects interact with each other and it's only those objects interaction that will give me an answer uh, irrelevant objects and so on will not interfere with my task so a program will basically determine which properties I'm computing with. So the network is attending to different, so you're attending to different parts of the network um, depending on the program. Uh, so A, A is an answer? Oh no, A is the action. action. Okay. Yeah, we're in continuous control still. Okay. So it's the robot arm moving. So you're not giving it a, a supervised yeah. label. Yeah, you can think of this as, the easiest way to think of this is a, it's a sophisticated way of doing gating. Uh, according to the context, you do different things. Except here the gating has gone more fine grain to deal with different properties um, and different logical uh, constructs. Um, Sorry, by the way, I, I heard lots of questions. I keep rushing you because <laughs> there's a second part to this talk <laughs> that I'm trying to get to. Um, this is very exciting, by the way. I'm super excited about this work. And like I said, it's an archive. And, uh, um, and if you have questions, please do talk to me. Uh, email Misha Daniel, who would love to chat with you about this. Um, it also is able to ignore new objects. So if you put irrelevant new objects in the background, it does very well at doing that. Um, what it's not as good at uh, is when you introduce new objects and you have to do something with that new objects, like a new color or a new shape or new color and shape. Okay, so that's really hard. You've never seen this object and you have to deal with it. And in fact, this is a whole, one of the things that we use as a an example of dog intelligence. You know, you can send dogs to, you can train dogs to fetch particular objects, the squidgy and the poofy and whatever. And then if you then send the dog to fetch the Benny, it goes back, it sees a squidgy, an unknown object. It assumes that that's a known object is the Benny. And so it will grab it and will bring it to you. Um, I think border collies at least are capable of doing that. Um, and so it's, it's something we would want to have an agent. This is how we actually specify those sentences, by the way. Um, um, and this uh, plot here, what it demonstrates is if it learns on the blue tasks, and then you switch and make these the train and the other one, so, so switch tasks and start training on new tasks, it's, you don't get what most neural networks would do, which is completely collapse on this particular task. So even though we switched to another task, the curves for this task did not deteriorate. They stayed up. In some cases, they actually improved. So, so th we would actually want that. We not only don't want the deterioration, but if you've learned to do something and you move to a new environment, where you're doing something that still reuses this other skill, you'd actually want to keep getting better at this previous skill. So you, then you retroactively go back. So if you go back to the other task, you should do it more quickly. I think that should be a design goal for all our agents, that they can continue learning and that when they go back and use uh, to doing something else that involves a shared skill, they can do that previous thing even more efficiently um, than before. So because we have this, because we're learning this indicator matrix, so we're learning to go from these continuous features to a matrix that indicates properties and objects, um, where we've made one assumption that we have segmented objects. We know the, the, the objects in the environment. What are the objects in the environment? Um, then we can actually peer into the network activations. These are, this is basically the gating matrix. And we can actually see that 
you can look into the network and interpret what it's doing. It's, uh, at this point in time, it's interpreting the scene as having a blue sphere and having a red uh, sphere and having a, and so on. You can look into the mind of the agent. And of course, when you introduce these new objects that you had never seen before, it sort of gets a bit harder. So it, it still knows that there's a red box there. Um, it seems to know that there is a sphere that is mostly blue, but now it's confused. So there's high uncertainty there. That's because it doesn't quite know this new thing, what it is. You, ha you haven't trained it for color. Uh, we can also do this from straight from pixels uh, without saying what the objects are. So here it has to learn to segment. And so you can see now what it learns is a sort of a, an attentional mechanism to a set of pixels to accomplish the task. And again, green here means it's succeeding at the task. So it sort of knows what to pay attention to, what should this object, what are the pixels that should be making this particular object. Um, baby steps toward understanding what an object is visually. I think much more is needed. Uh, my talk last week when I was going about learning to experiment, I had these tasks that were about learning weight. And uh, one of the tasks that I didn't go into was object cohesion. Um, there are also tasks that are about understanding that if these pixels keep moving together in front of you, that's because it's probably the same thing. All these different pixels um, in your retina um, seem to be moving together. So we use all this knowledge to eventually get an understanding of objects. Um, a good understanding of objects is still an open problem in AI. It has not been solved. Until we get that, uh, we're very far from anything close to AI. It's a very exciting problem, though. And we'll get there. Another way of specifying rewards, as I said, is imitation. And here I'm going to go quickly over some work that Josh Morrell and Zi Wang sort of have led at DeepMind. And of course, that is, there's a team that also involves uh, uh, Nicholas Hees, who's been doing wonderful work in control, Greg Wayne, um, who brought you the Neural Turing machine and many other amazing. Uh, things with other collaborators at DeepMind, and Scott Reed, uh, who does a lot of work on GANs, density modeling, and so on, um, in my team. Um, so I mentioned to you this paper of uh, OpenAI, uh, where they're doing one-shot imitation learning. Um, this is one of my favorite papers of the year. There's, there's a few, I have a few favorite papers. Um, so. And it's probably a subjective view, but um, I like this one. Um, and so what it does, it specifies a policy. Instead of being just actions given observations, it's actions given observations and a demonstration or a data set, a small data set. So now at test time, what this is saying is, at test time, expect that you will encounter some data. And then you should learn how to use that data and your observations about the world to choose your action. I love this model of computing. It is, I think it's, going to, it's, it's related to learning to learn, and it's, one, and it's zero shot, one shot, uh, well, not zero shot, one shot uh, or a few shot learning, which I think is one of the most exciting areas now in deep learning. Um, it's about how at test time, even though you train your model with a lot of data, and, and yes, it takes forever, like it uses 800 GPUs for a, for, a, for a year or whatever, but at the end of the day, you will have something, uh, and such was evolution. It was a very lengthy um, process that consumed a lot of energy. But at the end of the day, you're left with a model that just given a few data, it can learn uh, to reach um, a, a conclusion and to make a decision, to choose an action. Um, and they show, they had an impressive simulation showing how it learns to stack blocks. 
Again, this involves sort of using a gripper, grabbing, putting things on top of other things. This is very hard to do. I mean, it's like our robots can't do this. Um, so, um, so this was quite an achievement on their part. Um, one thing to make this possible, though, is they use a lot of data. Um, the way they will learn this policy is just as essentially they have very sophisticated models also involving the kinds of attention that I just described um, before. Um, and in fact, a lot of our inspiration came from reading their paper um, on this part about their particular attention mechanism. But one way to think about this uh, for deep learners, think of this as a sequence to sequence model. A demonstration is just a sequence and you have this other input and you output a sequence of actions. Okay, so it's just a recurrent neural network, sequence to sequence. So if you model the policy as a sequence to sequence model, then you can deal with these demonstrations. And you do a job, at, a good job at doing this. Now why is imitation important? Um, it's important because one of the biggest problems in RL is exploration. Like bringing two blocks together, what made it hard was exploration. If on the other hand, you have someone demonstrating how you bring these three things together, then that problem is not hard um, anymore. Um, as we saw, that robot is able to even stack these objects one on top of the other. It doesn't mean that everything is easy with exploration. If you try to play Montezuma and this Atari game where there's keys and so on, um, just doing exploration, just doing imitation there is very hard. Because when humans play and they see the, these few pixels that are indicative of a key, humans not only know that that's a key, but they know all the affordances of a key. They know that a key in the context of a game is probably something they should touch. And it's probably something that will allow them to open something later on. Um, so we make all these inferences. We, if we see something that looks like a ladder, like we immediately infer that we can go up and down on it. If there's a set of pixels in 2D that look, that sort of go like this and then down, then you immediately infer uh, that if you get to the edge, you're going to fall and you're going to die because you have this intuitive physics understanding of how things work in that 2D domain. You basically bring in all the knowledge that you have from the world into playing that game. So if you just imitate from that limited information that you have there, you're missing all this other knowledge base that you have in your head. Um, however, for other tasks like this, like tying a knot, something that a robot also can't do, um, it's, um, imitation is very useful. And in fact, like I said, most anim for most animals, imitation is essential uh, for survival. It's one of the most important um, aspects uh, of learning. Um, also, if you imitate, you just need to reproduce what other agents do. Um, you don't need to, uh, so the reward is what the other agents do. Um, you could imitate many things, and that's what I'm going to show you now. And of course, um, imitation is essential to learning. Imita you can bootstrap on imitation. Um, by using imitation, you can actually learn robust uh, control policies. OK, so what ZU and Josh have focused on is in how to robustly imitate not one behavior, but many behaviors. So one of the big goals of AI is not to just do one thing again but to do many things. That's sort of been the, the sort of what I've been championing here is how you should be thinking about this. Um, and, and so you would like agents that are capable of a whole huge repertoire of behaviors. Um, learn many of these. And then another thing that would come that is, I will not talk about, but it's important, is how to efficiently reuse all these behaviors to solve new tasks. How to do the zero shot thing. Um, here's the big insight. Generative modeling 
Um, that thing that everyone does, the GANs, the GAN mania, everyone going after images and so on, it has a very useful use. And that use besides generating uh, pictures is imitation. Um, so you can take a variation, you can totally formulate how you learn a policy or a transition model as a variational autoencoder. So you could have a sequence to sequence encoder that produces an embedding, Z. Um, as, uh, actually, how many of you were here last week? This should be all review, okay. So this for, for like 90 something percent of you is review. You produce an embedding and from that embedding you try to generate um, a context for this uh, policy or a context for a transition model which you're learning. So you can actually formulate this as the usual or variational autoencoder laws where you would have a likelihood except the likelihood here is in terms given a, set, given a sequence of data produced by another agent that other agent could be a human or it could be just another reinforcement learning agent. Um, your likelihood it basically consists of your policy and your transition model and then of course you have this regularizer where you sort of have the, uh, you're trying to move away from the prior. Um, in this case um, uh, for, for Josh these axes are actually the, the the, the angles in a humanoid that I will show you to you soon. And of course the angles of my joints they're all correlated. Uh, there are certain poses I can't do. Um, and so the way they model this here is with a, an autoregressive model. So this is a, uh, like a wave net, uh, pixel CNN um, that uh, we were introduced to last week. So we have two types of generative models here. We're missing one, GANs, next slide. Uh, oh, not yet. But this will motivate the GANs. What is the problem with imitating from data? So we saw that paper um, of OpenAI. I was doing a very good job um, at doing the blocks. And in their case, they actually considered, uh, they ended up realizing that just because they had a lot of data, um, the agent actually could just learn in a supervised way from data. Um, so why would we want to then do reinforcement? Um, and the reason is the following. Suppose you learn to drive always in the middle of the road, uh, road here without lines. Um, so if you get a lot of data for this, the, the, um, the agent will do well. But let's assume that all of a sudden you encounter yourself in a slightly different road and you veer a little bit off the road, the center of the road. At that point, you are in a situation that is not in the training date. And as Rich Sutton pointed out yesterday, we live in RL, we're in the world of sequential predictions, multiple temporal predictions. And what happens then is that if your model makes an error of epsilon, at the next step it could become epsilon squared, then it's epsilon cubed, and so, so, so the error can compound over time very easily and you end up crashing. And so we want to avoid that situation. So we want to come up with a way of coming up with a policy that starts at the supervised, uh, at what you get from supervision, but then you sort of want to create a potential field around it. Something that every time you detour a little bit from the middle of the road, it pushes you back to the middle of the road. You want to have these corrections. The way to achieve this um, one way to achieve this is through introducing reinforcement learning and uh, in particular using GANs. So GANs again review, um, you have a discriminator um, that is trying to tell apart uh, data from fake data, from samples produced by a generator given a random embedding. And the, basically the discriminator will, will say it's one if it's um, if it's real data and in it's zero if it's fake data. So it's basically trying to maximize the likelihood of being right. So the discriminator is trying to maximize the likelihood of being right on the data and minimizing the probability of being right on the not data, the fake uh, simulation. And then of course the, dis the, uh, the generator is trying to fool the discriminator. It's trying to do exactly the opposite. 
Um, to do RL, we do exactly the same thing. Um, so the data distribution here is the data that was produced by the expert, the data that we have to imitate, the trajectory. And then our policy is um, the generator. Okay, so the expert will give us this, pi of e. Um, there's a sort of an expert policy. And then we need to come up with the parameters of this generator, of this policy, this way of generating actions and consequently trajectories in the world. And, and you can formulate it exactly as a GAN. So imitation then becomes a problem of a GAN. And this is essentially what Jonathan Ho and Stefan Ehrman did last year. And I think they got a, a, a best paper award for it. Um, and they truly deserve it because it was a very cool insight. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, the reward for the, for the discriminator then is, uh, well, is to do the opposite of what the generator is trying to do. Um, one thing that Josh and Zio did was that in addition to have that GAN objective, because you have also something that you've trained before, this variational encoder, they, they considered um, taking the expectation of the Gale objective over all the possible embeddings of by, uh, by encoding the trajectories. Um, the reason for doing this um, is as follows. In GANs, there is something called mode dropping. Who's heard of mode dropping? It's, uh, okay, most of you. Okay, it's a popular term. So basically, or mode collapse and so on. Basically, ten, um, GANs as well as policy gradients, they tend to be greedy. If you put it together, they're even greedier. So they tend to just pick one behavior. So if you're imitating, they will sort of become very good at imitating one behavior, but they will ignore all the other behaviors. And so by integrating over um, a distribution of uh, possible embeddings, uh, what you get is essentially you get a mixture. So uh, the reward is unimodal, but if you marginalize over many possible things, you end up with uh, many possible things. So you get a mixture of behaviors. So this is a way of getting around the, the issues that GANs and policy gradients have and to get diversity. Um, the paper has a theorem with uh, all the details on how to do this. Um, so here are some examples um, to finish. Um, this is imita imitating again a Jake robot arm. Um, here there is a lot of data, so demonstrations, um, actually I'm going to go quickly on this. So the demonstrations will sort of pretty much follow what the arm is doing. Um, I think one thing I want to show you that's sort of important is that you, if you take the embeddings, so you have these Z embeddings, and because you have these Z embeddings, you can actually, given two trajectories, you can learn two policies, and then you can interpolate between these policies, and you get this beautiful smooth behavior. This is kind of showing you that this embedding is capturing structure about the space of the things that it has to do. Um, here is uh, a 2D walker example, and so, and to in show you like the extent to which you can it learn to imitate many diverse behaviors. So here is learning, uh, on the right is the imitator, and I think on the left is the real one. And it's just learning to do all these walks. So that's the second walk. How much time do we have? Not enough. This video goes on for ha half an hour. Um, it learned, okay, I'm gonna go forward. So that's, uh, th that's from uh, the Monty Python one. Uh, it can do many different varieties of moonwalks. Um, and, and so on. Okay. So this biped is not doing one thing. Oh, there we go. That's a moonwalk. Yeah, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> That's like me trying to do a moonwalk. So it's able to do not just one thing, but many things. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, and here's something more interesting. So now we're looking at a humanoid with 60-something degrees of freedom. 
and we're learning a controller for that humanoid. That, that is no small feat. Uh, being able to control something of that complexity, we're looking at 62 um, dimensional continuous space, is, is very hard. Well, these are the different behaviors that it, um, that it does. <laughs> this is from a CMU mock-up um, uh, database. And so they've chosen these particular labels for their walks. My favorite one is the one that comes later. The, well, anyway, um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Important. Because this is such a hard control problem, and now you have these contacts and so on, um, if you just did supervised, this would be the amount of error you would get. This is the number of times you would fail to imitate. Whereas if you add the extra GAN stage of, and do control, your error drops this much. So here it's really important to be robust. Uh, and that's because we have few data. So if you have few data, you have to do control in, to complement the supervision. Um, so another thing you did is interpolation. So how to go from one behavior to another behavior. So so there are two demonstrations. It starts by imitating one and then it sort of moves on to imitating the other one. So it can switch behaviors. Even though I wasn't trained. Um, so. So this is kind of getting to the point of what I was saying before. You want an agent that can learn to reuse different behaviors to do uh, more complex things. The real test will be when we start using these agents to do all to stack boxes and do many more varied tasks. And uh, it continues and continues. Catwalk. Oh, Gotta see that one. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, very quickly, some exciting trends. There's been many other works that are sort of similar. In terms of diverse behaviors, um, there is a very nice paper from UBC um, that will be presented at SIGGRAPH this year, where they actually show how the environment also provides very interesting constraints for agents to learn to walk. Um, so they can make it follow different uh, policies and so on. And it's being presented in graphics. It's using this hierarchical controller. I think it's using one of Ado's algorithms. So the point to get out of that picture is the world of graphics and deep learning are coming together again. So if you want to work in those areas, at that interface, there's, I think, a lot to do. Um, third person imitation is also important. Uh, when babies learn to imitate adults, they have very different bodies, and yet they're able to deal with it. Um, if, if, if you're uh, grabbing a red spoon, they'll grab a blue spoon. So the spoons need not be of the same color. And this is the kind of thing that um, Peter Abiel and colleagues were doing uh, at Berkeley and OpenAI, was to do this type of imitation when the objects might be different, the shape of the bodies might be dif different, and so on. It's called third person imitation. Um, there's been also some very cool Google papers on this. Um, I think it's a very hot area. That's it. Thank you.